2023 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. For the record, my name is Barbara Howard and I serve as chair of the commission. Just a reminder to please silence your cell phones and other electronic devices and to speak into the microphone whether you're here in the dais or giving testimony today. Would the clerk please call the roll so that we may verify the presence of a quorum. Commissioner Bjornberg is absent. Commissioner Booty. Present. Dreyer. Present. Chair Howard. Present. Malblum is absent. Nystrom. Present. Vice Chair Sample. Present. Mastin. Present. Struthers is absent. Vanderike. Here, lucky for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> there are seven members present. Let the record reflect we do have quorum and that commissioners Bjornberg, Melblum, and Struthers all provided proper notice that they have conflicts this afternoon, so their absences are excused. Our first order of business is to adopt an agenda for this meeting. We'll work from the agendas that are available over by the clerk. I'll go through the agendas and sort out any items to be withdrawn, continued, uh, which items will be discussed, um, and any, any items to be put on a consent agenda. Item number four, 905 Park Avenue, Ward 7. This application is for a certificate of appropriateness. Item number four will be discussed. Item number five, 1407 Nicollet Avenue, Ward 7. Uh, this application is also for a certificate of appropriateness and item number five will be discussed. Item number six, update to the 2003 Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission's design guidelines for on-premise signs and awnings, all wards. This application is for design guidelines adoption and item number six will be discussed. As long as I don't try to say 2023 every time I see that 2003. So the proposed agenda, the following items will have staff presentation, public comment, and commission discussion and action. Item number four, 905 Park Avenue, Ward 7, Ward 7. Item number five, 1407 Nicollet Avenue, Ward 7. Item number six, update to the 2003 Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission's design guidelines for on-premise signs and awnings. That is all words. Commissioners may have a motion to approve the proposed agenda. Nice room, so moved. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Is there a second? Sambolt, second. Thank you, Commissioner Sambolt. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The agenda is approved. Our next order of business will be to approve the minutes for our May 2nd, 2023 meeting. May I have a motion to approve those minutes? Sambolt, so moved. Thank you, Commissioner Sambolt. Is there a second? Mastin seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Mastin. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Nice room abstains. The minutes are approved. Before I open the hearing to public comments, let me summarize the process for conducting public hearings. Uh, we will take each of the agenda items in order. Planning staff present it, the report and commissioners ask questions of staff. Then I'll open the public hearing and we'll hear from the applicant and commissioners may ask questions of the applicant. After that, we'll invite other public comment. If you wish to speak, you need to do two things. Be sure to sign in on the sheet over by the clerk. If you haven't done this already, you can also do that afterward. When you come up to testify, be sure to state your name and address for the record. And please keep your comments specific to the application that's before us today. If you happen to have materials to hand out, also hand those to the clerk so that they can be distributed to the commission and also entered into the public record. Uh, do not approach the commissioners on the dais. After public comments are complete, I'll close the hearing and commissioners will dis deliberate and act on the applications before us. So let's get started. Our first item, item number four, 905 Park Avenue, Ward 7. Application is for a certificate of appropriateness. The staff report is presented by Aaron Kay. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Howard and Commissioners. My name is Erin Kay, and I'm a city planner in the Historic Preservation Subsection of the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development, or CPED. I'm here today to present a Certificate of Appropriateness application for the property located at 905 Park Avenue South in the 9th Street South Historic District. Staff have not received any public correspondence related to this project. The subject property, historically known as Kvaltsen Electric, is located at 905 Park Avenue South 
It was designed by Thorshav and Cerny, built in 1957, and is a non-contributing resource to the 9th Street South Historic District. The west elevation is shown here in the bottom left corner of the slide. The applicant is proposing several exterior alterations, including replacement of the main entrance bay on the west elevation, updates to the roof, and changes to fenestration on the rear. Starting with the main entrance bay, the applicant proposes to replace the aluminum framed windows and door in kind. The applicant has indicated that the current door is not secure and the windows are only single pane, which affects temperature control. The glass is also cracked, as shown here on the right side. The proposed replacement will be double pane. This circa 1970 photograph shows that the original main entrance bay featured the door at the left end, as it remains today, and two windows to the right. And by circa 1980, the bay was divided into three windows as it remains today. The proposed design retains the current configuration of the windows and doors and is compatible. The applicant is proposing to add a horizontal mullion to reinforce the framing system at the height of the mullion in the adjacent window bays. However, to differentiate this replacement entrance bay from the original design of the building, staff recommends conditioning that the mullion be installed at the height of the transom instead. On the roof, the applicant proposes to remove the existing skylights, which date from circa 2003 to 2006 and are deteriorating, patch the roof deck and recover it with a new EPDM roofing membrane, replace the existing rooftop mechanical units, add an elevator overrun that will be one foot 10 inches tall, and add a solar panel array, which is depicted by the blue rectangles on this aerial image. Staff finds these changes to be appropriate and will not be visible from the public right of way. The applicant also proposes to remove the original brick chimney due to cracking and deterioration, and because it is no longer used. The chimney is partially visible in a direct view of the building, but minimally visible at an angle. Staff finds the removal to be appropriate given its condition, lack of use, and non-contributing status of the subject property. On the rear elevation, the applicant proposes to replace several fenestration openings and add a new window. On the first story of the two-story portion, the single-leaf steel pedestrian door would be replaced in kind. The partially glazed metal overhead door to the right would be replaced with a metal overhead door. And then on the first story of the one-story portion, the right metal overhead garage door would be replaced in kind. These changes are on the rear elevation and will be minimally visible from the public right-of-way. Additionally, the changes to be made are generally in kind and will resolve deteriorating conditions and or security issues. The left garage opening on the one-story portion that is currently filled with studs and plywood would be replaced with concrete block infill. In order to differentiate the new infill from the original building material, staff recommends conditioning that the new concrete blocks be set back at least one inch. The applicant also proposes to add a new fixed aluminum framed window at the north or right end of the second story and a new louvered vent on the east elevation of the one-story wing. Both alterations require some removal of historic fabric, however, they are on the rear elevation and related to the adaptive reuse of the building, thereby complying with the design guidelines for this district. Finally, the roof decking on the one-story wing is proposed for replacement and will not be visible from the public right-of-way. In summary, staff finds that the proposed exterior alterations comply with the design guidelines and meet the Secretary of the Interior standards. Staff recommends that the Heritage Preservation Commission adopt staff findings and approve the Certificate of Appropriateness to allow for exterior alterations to the property located at 905 Park Avenue South in the 9th Street South Historic District subject to the following conditions. Number one, in the southern bay of the first story of the west elevation, the horizontal mullion shall be placed at the height of the transom above the entry door. Number two, for the infilled garage opening on the south elevation of the rear one-story wing, the concrete masonry units shall be set back a minimum of one inch from the original wall to differentiate the infill from the original building material. Number three, the solar panels will not be visible from the public right-of-way. And then the standard two conditions for approval. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to stay for questions, and the applicant is also available. Thank you for the report. Commissioners, are there questions for staff? Commissioner Sambo. Thank you, Chair Howard. Uh, I have a couple of questions for staff. One, um, in the staff report, it says that the um, garage, the one-story portion on the back of the building may have been historic. 
was that in reference, do we, do we believe that that one story portion exists from the period of significance, which goes up to 1915? Um, do we have any, I guess, information that that portion of the property is older than the rest of the building? Chair Howard, Chair, Vice Chair Sandbelt, thanks for that question. Um, the wing is believed to be original to the building built in 1957, not date to the period of significance for the historic district. Okay. Then I have one more question. Um, in the condition number one, when you say that the mullion shall be placed at the height of the transom above the entry door, what you're saying is that the horizontal mullion that's being proposed additional into that storefront system would align with the top of the door um, and so that it would be consistent with that mullion that's above the door. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff? Yes, that's it. All right, I'll now open the public hearing for this item. Applicant is here, and would you like to speak? Yes. Name and address. All right, Commission, I am Rachel Peterson with Hess Royce & Company. We're at 100 North 1st Street here in Minneapolis. Um, I'm here to provide mostly a project update, and then we have a request for you. But um, our intent with this project was to have it on the consent agenda today. And then our project team was made aware yesterday um, that the proposed CMU infill in this bay had already been constructed, um, which was news to us. Um, and, you know, misunderstanding about what what uh, required HBC review um, on the, the part of the property manager, and also there have been some security issues with this wood infill. Uh, there have been several break-ins to the building uh, over the winter and in the past couple of months, and so um, the contractor went a little bit rogue and built the CMU infill wall, built it flush with the facade, um, the plane of the facade, and so because that is contrary to um, the condition recommended by staff that we were prepared to accept, we thought we should come in and discuss this with you all today. Um, so here's what that wall currently looks like. Um, and I just wanted to point out to you a couple of things as you consider this. Um, the header across this opening is brick, and there's also a uh, metal lintel that runs across the top of that opening that differentiate it from the concrete block infill. Um, the, the jam to the right of the infilled opening is also a smooth concrete, so we've got some additional differentiation there. And I've got a closer up photo of that. So that's all to say that this opening and its dimension will still be legible as is, even with the, the facade being repainted as proposed, um, but currently does not have that additional reveal that was conditioned. Um, This is, you know, it's a reversible infill, this, um, this alteration that has happened. It, it can be removed. Um, and I also wanted to, to emphasize that this is the rear facade of a non-contributing resource in a historic district. Um, it is really not visible from the street. I included some additional photos here. On the left, you can see from the, the primary facade along Park Avenue and even from the alleyway in the back. This is pretty tucked in. Um, to the L of the building and is not particularly visible. So our request is that we strike that condition requiring the reveal um, if it's amenable to you and allow this wall to remain as it is. Um, it is a cost concern for the owners to take it down and rebuild it. Um, I'm here for questions. We also have two of the project architects here for questions if you have any concerns or uh, questions about why they designed it to be flush to begin with. but. Um, any questions? Thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm. Any questions from commissioners? Commissioner Sample. <laughs> Do you have concerns with the other two conditions that uh, staff has recommended? No. Nope. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicants? I don't see any. Thank yep. you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak for or against this application? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Commissioners, let's discuss. Commissioner Sample. 
I do all the talking. Um, considering that the back portion of the building, the one story is, you know, it's a, it, the whole structure is a non-contributing structure and that the back portion is not visible from the street and the public right away, I really don't um, have any concerns with the infill as done. Obviously, we don't like to see work done before we approve, but I understand sometimes things happen. Um, so. I think I'm I'm perfectly fine with uh, kind of striking that second condition. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that we approve um, the certificate of appropriateness with um, the conditions one, three, four, and five as listed in our agenda, and striking condition number two. Thank you, Commissioner Sambolt. Is there a second? Nystrom seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Chair Howard. Aye. Commissioner Dreyer. Aye. Mastin. Aye. Nystrom. Aye. Vice Chair Sandbolt. Aye. Vanderike. Aye. There are seven ayes. Thank you. That motion passes. We'll move on to our next item, item number five, 1407 Nicollet Avenue, Ward 7, and I understand Commissioner Mastin needs to declare something. I will abstain from voting on this item. Thank you, Commissioner Mastin. The staff report is presented by John Smoley, and this is, a, if I didn't say it before, it's an application for a certificate of appropriateness. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. I'm John Smoley, and I'm pleased to be before you to present a certificate of appropriateness to replace the historic marquee with a new marquee that displays two dynamic signs and other signage at 1407 Nicollet Avenue, the former Loring Theater and individual historic landmark. The Loring Theater was completed in 1920 as a silent film theater and vaudeville house for owners Finkelstein and Rubin. Built in the classical revival style with Beaux Arts features, the theater features the era of uh, reflects the era of progress experienced in Loring Park during the turn of the century, when the area developed into established commercial and private properties. In 1943, the theater's original rectangular canopy turn marquee, which you can see in the left side of your screen, was replaced with a trapezoidal mar marquee, uh, which you can see on your right as it currently appears. Due to the rise in popularity of television, the theater was shut down in 1955, and that is the end of the period of significance for this landmark. It was sold and converted into a church by the Evangelical Association. Since then, the theater has been rehabilitated and renamed the Music Box Theater, and is now currently owned by Wooddale Church. And there was a period of time in the 1980s where it was also known as the Cricket Theater. On November 29th of last year, the HPC denied the applicant's certificate of appropriateness application to replace the historic marquee with a new marquee that displays two dynamic signs and other signage. In making its determination in November, the commission discussed the lack of evidence provided regarding the deterioration of the marquee itself. The applicant has since prepared a conditions analysis and proposed changes from the previous submittal in this application before you this evening. I'm going to begin by describing the current proposal to you, then I'll describe how the current application differs from the one you reviewed in November of last year. The applicant's current proposal is to replace the historic trapezoidal painted steel sheet metal marquee that you can see, oh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, let me go back one slide. There. Um, that's as it appeared in 1955, and this is as it appears today on the left. They'll be replacing that with a new trapezoidal painted aluminum sheet metal marquee, both possessing the same dimensions. The existing and proposed signage differ, however, most notably in the proposed replacement of two backlit manual changeable copy signs. They'll be replacing those with dynamic signs. And you can see on the left, those backlit changeable copy signs in white, and on the right, the uh, 
the um, two signs on the side of the trapezoid that um, depict uh, McPowell and the family reunion as just an example of what might appear on those dynamic signs, which can change electronically. A dynamic sign is defined as a sign, or any element of a sign, which provides the ability to change text or images, or exhibit change in effects, in order to provide intermittent illumination, or the illusion of such illumination, or any series of imagery or display which may appear to move or change, including changes produced by any electronic method. There is other signage currently on the theater, and you can see it in the right photo in the recessed entryway. There are eight non-historic, externally illuminated wall signs. The current proposal differs, differs from the November 2022 proposal in three ways. Number one, the proposed canopy sign materials have been changed from trimless, facelit channel letters with routed acrylic faces to open face channel letters with faux neon banding inside each letter. And those canopy signs or you know, marquee signs atop the marquee, you know, for lack of a better term, are these three up here. Music box, the large M, and music box over on the right. The second change from, uh, in this proposal that, that uh, is different from the last proposal is the dynamic sign sizes have been reduced. They're now eight, and half, eight feet five inches wide by three feet eight inches high. Um, distinctly smaller than the last iteration of signage proposed. And then in terms of changes, the third change, the applicant has demonstrated through their conditions analysis that the marquee sheet metal, especially the soffits sheet metal tiling, is non-historic and beyond repair. In terms of public comments, staff received one comment letter from the neighborhood group in support of the proposal. Photographic evidence indicates that only two of the four steel cables that held up the original 1920 theater canopy turned marquee remain. You can see the four cables there and the two cables that are remaining here. The applicant proposes to preserve only these elements along with two cantilever joists which are not visible. They're set inside the marquee itself. The exterior signage and illumination on the marquee have changed completely, however. However, the form of the marquee remains. White backlit sign panels have, replaced, have been replaced. Framing for the backlit sign panels possessing a six by seven configuration in 1955, which you can see on the left, was replaced with a similar panel with framing in an eight by seven configuration in the 1970s, which you can see on your right. Many small bare bulbs that once projected from the soffit of the canopy, which you can see on your left, uh, they're a little indistinct there, but your staff report packet has a, a closer uh, photo. Um, those bare bulbs were replaced by 1970 with a smaller amount of larger inset lights, which you can see here in the soffit of the canopy and in today's canopy as well. In neon, the music box signs, which you can see here, were placed atop two sides of the marquee in 1993, which replaced neon channel lit letters that read Loring in 1955, which you can see in the photo on the left. Uh, bare bulbs mounted around the rectangular panels, which you can see here, are also from the 90s. Here you can see the uh, theater in the 1980s when it was named the Cricket Theater, and you can see the marquee from the theater in the 1980s. Diagonally arranged lettering on the front fascia of the marquee was replaced by 1970 with a white backlit sign panel with framing for clip-in letters. Then it was replaced again between July of 2021 and October of 2022 with a black backlit sign panel for Wooddale Church. And this is the marquee's present condition, as you can see on the right. Staff recommends approval of the current request except for the proposed dynamic signs. Since the November 2022 Certificate of Appropriateness Application Denial, the applicant has demonstrated that the removal and replacement of the historic marquee 
inclusive of its structure from 1943 is warranted. The applicant has provided a conditions analysis that demonstrates the significant deterioration of multiple components of the marquee and evidence that the sheathing materials are non-historic. Due to the deterioration demonstrated, the marquee's replacement with a new marquee of the same dimensions, as noted in the applicant's analysis, will generally maintain the landmark's integrity. The proposed use of dynamic or digital LED signboards will impair that integrity, however. These dynamic signs introduce a design feature that allows rapid changes in the appearance of the marquee. It also uses materials not available during the landmark's period of significance, 1920 to 1955. Theaters during this time period utilize manual changeable copy signs, not dynamic signs, both of which will total almost 62 square feet in area, just 14 square feet shy of the maximum amount of all building mounted signage permitted by the zoning code on this building. By replacing the manual changeable copy signs with large dynamic signage, the integrity of design, materials, workmanship, and feeling will be compromised. The applicant has submitted a letter from the sign maker, Dactronics, indicating that they can disable the dynamic sign's ability to display animated content. However, even with this limitation, the dynamic signs will change the character of this landmark in such a way that it no longer retains its integrity to which it derives its significance under criteria one and four. For this reason, CPED recommends the Heritage Preservation Commission approve the certificate of appropriateness to replace the historic marquee with a new marquee that displays two dynamic signs and other signage subject to the conditions of approval listed in the staff report, which again notes that we recommend denial of the dynamic sign request. I'm available for any questions you may have, and I know the applicant team and a few members of the public are here who would like to speak to you as well. Thank you for the report, commissioners. Are there questions for staff? I'm not seeing any, thank you. I will now open the public hearing for this item. The applicant is here and would like to speak. Be sure to state your name and address for the record. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Trent Palmberg. Uh, I am with 1407 Nicollet Avenue, the Music Box Theater in Wooddale Church. I'm also a resident of Minneapolis with my wife and our son, Finn, who is now one year old. I know when I came uh, last time, we had just a newborn, but he's somehow one year old uh, already. We live at 4619 Oakland Avenue on the south side. First of all, I want to thank you for your service of uh, the city by being on the Historic Preservation Committee. This is an important task that you have, and it means a lot to me personally because I love this, the, the history of this city. I mean, this room itself was designed by the same architects that designed the Loring Theater, which is now the Music Box Theater, the historic integrity of this property matters. It matters to me personally. Minneapolis is home to me. I'm a graduate of the Blake School right across the park in Kenwood, and now I've given my life to community development and managing this historic theater in the Loring Park neighborhood and the Loring Park community. This presentation I have put together myself. I've done all this research. There's no central book that holds all the research for the Loring Theater, so I'm kind of the nerd that goes to the floor of the library, pulled all the research because I wanted to know, because I care about maintaining the historic integrity of this property for the city of Minneapolis, not just for yesterday, not just for today, but a sustainable future for this property in our city. So what I intend to tell you today is the story of this property and this theater and why I believe the full scope of work in its entirety is the best decision for the HPC, it's the best decision for the historic property, and it is the best decision for the city of Minneapolis. So let me tell you the story about what is the Music Box Theater, but what was the Loring Theater. In 1920, on December 4th, it was opened as one of the most premier silent film theaters in the entire country. It was known as the Marble Palace, and if you've ever been inside, you know the grand marble staircase and the banisters we have even restored, and it still has that, that glory. But just as movie and film and technology changes over time, so too did the theater. And in 1929, when uh, sound was added to movies, the theater went through its first major renovation, and they renovated the marquee, they renovated the interior, they renovated from we know of some of the artwork on the interior of the theater as well as movies came out to be talkies. 
Then in the 1940s, they renovated additionally. And you continue to see over decade over decade, the managers of this property renovated it knowing that they were in a commercial district and renovated specific to the marquee. You know, as John stated in his report in 1955, really the period of significance uh, in terms of this uh, historic significance ended because the, uh, the railroad tycoon, the streetcars, had ended with the bus, and that nearly wiped out the theater, and so it was acquired by a church in the 1950s, which through the 1980s continued to operate there. That church, from the best that we know of record, also modified the marquee into the 1970s, which, as the staff report correctly notes, changed everything uh, about it, including that manual copy sign was changed as well. Into the 1990s, in 1991, it was designated as the facade being a historic landmark. And then as the city report correctly shows, uh, the staff report, in 1993, it was changed again by an owner that is not Wooddale Church, by an owner by the name of Gary Kurt, and added the neon lights, changed the marquee again, added coloring. And so what we came in when we acquired the property in 2018 was a marquee that had been completely changed but also I noticed it had been completely changed since its inception in 1920. I mean, when you look at the record of this marquee, notice that in 1920, they have this flat top marquee with what I think must have been the latest technology at the time. They had these two signs on the sides that faced north and south and one sandwich board out front that just being the manager now, I assume there was some kind of strong wind that came through and probably blew those down off of the top of the marquee because you don't see them anymore when 10 years later they renovated the entire thing. And I noticed as they renovated, they added on height and they added on more places for dynamic messaging. That's what dynamic means. Dynamic just means changing. It's a dynamic sign now. Dynamic signage is what we aim to preserve with this update to the Music Box Theater. You can see that they could put letters on the top now. Now they could put letters facing north and south. And I don't think they could fit any more posters or anything on the outside of this theater. It was a vaudeville show. There was multiple shows. 20 cents any time you could see a show there. And it seemed that they were doing more messaging to continue to use the theater as a community asset. Into the 1950s, we know that this was renovated again. And like the staff showed, two of those cantilever, jo cantilever joists were removed, and then it became this, this three-sided shape. But if you notice, the very front of it, they wanted to preserve to be the iconic branding of the theater, so that people going there and people in the community would know what theater that was. It says Loring across the front. And then on the sides, there's these real cool Hollywood kind of channel letters that they put on top of it to show that it was the Loring Theater as well. And as you can see from the nighttime photograph, those lit up. In fact, the entire underside of it lit up with incandescent bulbs as well. If you notice even what they were doing at the theater, it was a community event. It was a cooking class. They wanted to continually use this marquee to let people in the community know what was happening and make it an asset to the neighborhood in a commercial district. Now, we don't have a ton of record on this, but we know that it was changed in the 1970s. I find it interesting, we don't have a single photo from the 1970s or 80s where any channel letters were ever up on this marquee. From my experience, it's because they don't work. The letters fall off. When you have to put them on manually and a wind comes through, they fall off. In the Minnesota winters, in the freeze-thaw temperatures, they warp. And every four or five years, you have to re-get up there and weld them together because it's like a 1940s technology that just wasn't carried over into the future. The 1970s, we don't see it being used. In fact, in the 1980s, you see a whole different technique being used. Now the theater had printed a separate sign to inset it into the marquee to let people know what that was. If you notice as well from the 1970s, the front of the sign had completely changed as well. They removed that iconic theater branding and then it's just, it's kind of boring, it's kind of blah, it's just three sides all in white. Then as you get to the 1990s, you see Triple Espresso, the highly caffeinated comedy that I'm sure we all saw. Uh, they used the same tactic. They made it even more dynamic, more flashing bulbs, neon, but then I assume 
the ineffectiveness of these channel letters, they just took signage and they inset it into the marquee. And that's the current marquee that we have, albeit much more deteriorated. I won't go through these slides again because uh, they are the same from the architecture report from Miller Dunwoody that we already have, so I won't waste time on that. But they found conclusively, which I know was the point of contention at the November hearing, that all of the material up there, save the two I-beams that it gets mounted onto jutting out from the, from the building, and the two cantilever joists, we intend to keep. We intend to preserve those as we build and restore the new marquee, but everything else they have found to be sufficiently deteriorated so that it cannot be restored. So I want to talk for a moment. Given that history, here's how we designed this. Based on the guidelines, we picked one, one focus for this and said, we want to design this to honor the past, yet we have to build it for a sustainable present and future. And so we chose that iconic design from the 1940s or 50s, whenever they updated that, and we wanted to bring it into today. And so what we did is we brought back the iconic front of it, so people knowing what the theater would be, so it says Music Box Theater on the front of it. We brought back those big Hollywood channel letter uh, name of the theater on the sides. We're keeping the name Music Box, as it's been there since the 1980s. But as I'll talk about more, we had to choose materials and design with an eye of being good city residents, really good global residents as well. We have to choose sustainable materials that align with the city's 2040 plan, that align with the Loring Park master plan as well. We did not want to design this in a bubble. So we got a lot of public feedback about this as well. We engaged Albrecht Sign Company and we said, how do we design this to honor the past we want to preserve the history, but how do we do that in such a way that this theater thrives and is preserved for generations to come? And so this is the design that we really came up with. As you see on the left, that is the, what we were aiming for in terms of the design features. And on the right, that's what we produced. The iconic branding in the front, the channel letters on top, and then these dynamic signs, again, which means changing. What's unique about these is that they are digital. They are LED. And I know the staff report says they have limitless functionality, which as the theater manager, I think that might be a little dramatic. They show color photos, and they are very controlled and can have limits placed on them as well. Some of the reason that we did that, that I want to talk through. We wanted to design a marquee with a similar look and feel, knowing that there aren't going to be materials available from the 1950s, and some of the materials from the 1950s would not be wise to design with or to build with for our modern city and being in a commercial district. We really wanted to have a marquee that honored the past, that allows for ease of communication. Notice how in every decade they change the marquee for more communication, for more community engagement. They built on, they built up. If anything, it's less than probably what they would say if they were before you from the 1950s. And lastly, environmental sustainability is very important for us. I don't know if you've been getting all the alerts like I do every morning about air quality alerts. This is a real deal. Global warming is real. And we need to design with an eye to that. One of the reasons we like these digital marquee displays is because they will reduce the environmental footprint by up to 70%. That is a goal of the city's 2040 plan. That is a goal of the Loring Park master plan. And it is a goal that we have, not as just a historic property owner, we really see ourselves as a historic property steward. And this is a wise decision that we want to make. But it's certainly not a decision that we're making on our own. There are precedents all over the United States that this is the direction it's moving in because it's wise for the property, it is wise for the city, and it's really wise for being global citizens in what's happening in our world with the environmental stakes. The Palace Theater is in St. Paul. You may know this story, but if you don't, the Palace Theater needed to get renovated. And so it was actually public money that renovated this. And it's been an amazing turnaround at the Palace Theater. I don't know if you've ever seen a show there, but it's an amazing property. And with public money, they redid the historic marquee and they implemented a digital screen, which is right in, in the center. These screens 
as I'll explain, have a lot of functionality to where you notice it doesn't look like Times Square, which I think maybe could be a fear or that the staff report would try to project that they are rapidly changing and it's gonna look like Times Square. That's not how these work. They function just like your smartphone, just like an iPhone or an Android phone. When you're out in the bright, it will automatically adjust. If it's dark, you can adjust it up. These are all settings that can be maintained within city policy. The palace was renovated and they specifically chose to include a digital message board. And that is in St. Paul. You know, another story is the Lebowski Center in Owasso, Michigan. They have a very uh, similar story, except theirs is much more tragic of their marquee. It burned down and so they needed to figure out how they're going to replace it and they did it with one of these signs. One of the cool things about it is you can make these look like the old time. Even it says software allows it to be programmed with lettering and copies the original marquee's look and feel. This is one of the benefits of being able to leverage digital technology to get its benefits, yet preserve the history of this. And this theater has been completely revamped and restored in the commercial district of this town. These marquees are not like the ones you see at a gas station. I remember the first time I heard about this, I said, I, I don't think we want that at the theater if this is just gonna look like what you see at like a holiday gas station. They are much more advanced than that. You know, the billboards that you may see on the highway, the one we've proposed to put in on our marquee is twice the pixel density. That's twice the resolution. So it's not even like you're looking at a digital screen, it just blends in to what you project onto it, and we want to make that investment to have a good quality screen. You know, we could talk about the Embassy Theater in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We could talk about the Fillmore Theater in Detroit, Michigan, a very similar story. The Lebowski Center again in Michigan. The Capri Theater. This is even happening in Minneapolis. They were redesigning their marquee and they have digital messaging boards for the different community events that they do. And they were allowed to have this. It's the Uptown Theater in Kansas City, Kansas. You know, I, I could have put in 50 more slides. Every major city, these are being implemented because it's a wise decision to preserve history, yet build it for a sustainable future so that historic properties can be properly and effectively maintained, but then they can be there for generations to come. And that's, that's our heart in stewarding this property. In light of this, I want to summarize why I sincerely believe that the full scope of this design, including the digital reader boards, is the best decision that the Historic Preservation Commission could make. It's in the best interest of the city of Minneapolis and really of our broader world with what's going on. I want to introduce to you seven considerations that I'd like you to make before public comment and as you deliberate. First, please consider the historic consistency of use of this property. History shows the music box marquee was consistently updated every decade for more messaging, for something that was more attractive, for something that was, had more modern technology from its period of historical significance from 1920 to 1955. The guidelines from the Secretary of the Interior state, quote, a property will be used as it was historically. A dynamic message center is historic. We are preserving the historic nature of this marquee to inform the community about what's happening in the theater and to do it in a way that is safe and sustainable. I would agree with the city report and their conclusions if, and only if, a marquee from the 1920s, a marquee from the 1930s, or even the 40s would have been preserved over these generations but we see the complete opposite. We see the marquee as supporting what was happening at the historic theater. You know that it's even been updated after it has been designated a historic landmark in the 1990s. In the staff report, I would just respectfully disagree because they choose a date and they make the assertion that the 1943 marquee was not the original marquee built with the theater in 1920, however, it has acquired significance of its own right by telling the evolution and development of this theater from silent film to full color motion pictures. And while that may be true, that's also conjecture. That's what's to say silent film isn't more important than the marquee in the 1940s. I think the best historic record is looking at it linear and saying what happened 
from 1920 to 1955, and what is happening today? It's one of the most amazing things about the historic record of this theater is that 103 years later, it is still a community asset. It is still being used as a mixed use space for the city of Minneapolis and for its neighborhood. That's what truly makes it great. Simply put, the theater was not built to support its marquee. The marquee always enhanced the historic nature of the theater. And as the guidelines state, quote, replacement of a deteriorated exterior sign shall be designed in the spirit of the original concept. And I genuinely believe that's what the full scope of this project does. Second, I'd ask for you to consider the marketplace competition. Other theaters within Minneapolis are being allowed to operate in a better, a faster, a cheaper, a more environmentally sustainable, and a safer way, while historic theaters are not. Wouldn't we want to take historic theaters, these great city assets, and not put them at an economic competitive disadvantage because of this? Third, I'd ask you to consider the precedent from locally historically designated theaters. The city 10 minutes away, St. Paul, has done this in multiple theaters, including with public money. There are many, many, many cities around the United States that are going in this direction. Fourth, I'd encourage you to consider the current use. Theaters aren't using the channel lettering currently. They have to find ways to get around this because it's ineffective and it's unsafe. You remember when Hamilton came to town just a month ago, and what did the Orpheum do? They printed signs and they affixed them over the channel lettering of their marquee. And when historic theaters have to do that, it's an increased cost, it's more stuff that ends up in our landfills, and it's more time on staff that have to get up on a ladder and do this stuff. The current use even would show historic theaters are struggling with this, and this is a wise investment. Fifth, I'd ask you to consider the maintenance costs of this. The channel boards are a 1940s technology that require extreme and undue maintenance. Every few years, you have to adjust them so that plastic letters can fit on them, and if they don't fit perfectly, they fall off. And I'm telling you, as the guy who does this, I have to get out a pole, or I have to now get on a ladder and get up there and change these. The maintenance cost is excessive. I'd ask you to please consider the, the energy sustainability. We must align with citywide goals and neighborhood goals for energy efficiency. These digital boards can reduce energy consumption by up to 70%. And I believe that historic preservation must take into account the future sustainability of our communities. Even privately owned residences are allowed to make energy updates in a line with the historic past of the property, but to have dual and triple pane windows. These are things we have to allow historic properties to do. And lastly, as I've already mentioned, there has been significant change since it was de designated as a historic property by an owner that was not ours. I truly believe that this is within the full spirit and honoring of the most historic record of this property. These boards are not as the staff report puts them out to be. They, they work just with the same effective technology of your smartphone. In the city, the, the staff report seems to indicate that given one of these, we would act in a wild, and, a wild and, and unchecked manner with these. Our property has never done that. Our organization has never done that. We plan on using everything within the city's policy limits and suggesting otherwise is just a pretense. We are responsible stewards of this historic property. I believe this honors the past. I believe it can be built in the present, invest in our city, and I believe it will be here for generations to come. But it's not just me. There are also people from our community because we've also engaged to get feedback, design consideration of the broader neighborhood of Loring Park, which represents nearly 13,000 people in the city of Minneapolis. So with that, I will turn it over. Thank you for that presentation. Commissioners, are there any questions for the applicant? Vice Chair Sambolt. Thank you, Chair Howard. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that the, um, the, the 
illumination level of the sign varies with the conditions in the environment. Um, is there a way to manually set the maximum level of illumination for that sign? Yep. Uh, okay. It is. Yep. They're completely customizable, similar to your phone, where you can set, nope, don't go this high, or just go with the sunlight. So if it's a cloudy day, it automatically adjusts. Same kind of technology. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioners? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. I see we have a couple of members of the public who would like to speak. Uh, first on my list is David Ebinger. And be sure to state your name and address for the record. Commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Evinger. I live at 419 Oak Grove Street in Loring Park. Um, I am here on behalf of myself and also the CLPC board of which I am a member. We have met, we have heard this presentation. We support the music box and the Wooddale Church in their application. I've been on the CLPC board for a few years now. I'm also a member of the Loring Park Safety Club the group that wears the orange shirts and goes around doing, picking up things and handing out safety flyers and things like that. We go by the music box all the time. It's important to us. I'm also a member of the Nicollet Avenue Safety Coalition. This facility is on a part of Nicollet Mall that is challenging. Their presence there their involvement with our community is so important to us. And we totally support what they are doing. As I mentioned, I'm a property owner at 419 Oak Grove. That is also known as the Daniel B. Lyon House, an 1892 Minneapolis landmark. So historical properties are important to me. I remember working with John Smoley on that project years ago. And so we know what it takes to keep these properties in shape, to take care of them for the benefit of our community. We care. Trent cares. The Wooddale Church and the Music Box really, really care. And I want to tell you, Trent, that we appreciate what you guys are doing over there because it helps all of us in Loring Park and in Minneapolis. This is a good thing. I'm sorry that we disagree with the HPC this time, but we have really good reasons for what we're doing here. Now, let's get down to the part of this that's really important, and that is we're talking about the marquee and that front signage. As you've heard, there have been multiple, multiple changes over the decades for virtually 100 years. It is constantly being brought up to speed with what is right for our community. That's been its hallmark. Not that it's caught and stuck at one point in time. There have been changes that are significant. You've seen some of them. It might be hard to just read, look at the photograph and pick it all up. When you go there and look at it, you can really see the style has changed, the shapes have changed, the colors have changed, the materials have changed, the types of the lettering have changed, and the type of lighting has changed. So this application includes the LED lightings and that computer-generated lettering. That's how I would phrase it, but I know you have more technical terms. Let me tell you. I was at a community gathering in the Loring Park Pavilion just a few weeks ago where the four candidates for the seventh ward, because you know we're going to have a, a new city council person from the seventh ward. And there was a gathering and the four candidates were there and they were questioned by the community and by a panel. And what was it about? Environmental concerns in Loring Park and in the seventh ward and the importance of LED modern lighting and how much it helps our community to have that. Loring Park, this whole community is concerned about it. That whole session with the four people running for the council position were all talking about it. 
It's important. So, let me raise one other thing. And this is personal. And that has to do with one of the things we did as we were fixing up the Daniel B. Lyon House, 1892. All single pane windows, when we got it, all failing. You couldn't open them. You couldn't work them. They weren't efficient. We got Marvin. We worked with, with Dr. Smoley. Marvin came in, figured out what they looked like at the time, and we redid the whole, all the windows. Huge cost. We put in triple pane windows. They were single pane windows to start. Do you think we would have even asked to use single pane windows or that we would be asked to use single pane windows? No, because we all know the environment, everything is better when you can use these modern things when, when you fit them in with what was traditionally there. And that's what these folks are trying to do. So the request of me, of the CLPC, and Phyllis is also on that board, and she's going to make a couple of comments too. What we ask is that you approve their application, and that you thank them for what they're doing for our community. Thanks. Thank you for those comments. Phyllis, I have you down next. If you could state your name and address for the record. My name is Phyllis Roden. I live at 410 Groveland. And I will be echoing a lot of David's comments. Um, I have lived in the neighborhood for seven years. I've been on the CLPC board for two. Um, and I'm here representing the board, which did, again, submit a letter asking you to approve this project for the Wooddale Church, which is an invaluable neighbor in our neighborhood. The Wooddale Church is situated in a particularly safety challenged part of our neighborhood. Wooddale is a critical partner in organizing and hosting a monthly public safety meeting with neighborhood leaders and city safety officials, in addition to its street outreach program. Not only would the proposed and desperately needed marquee renovation help advance the Loring Park Master Plan energy goals, it would allow Wooddale Church to effectively communicate its outreach to the community. Along with the replacement of our 50-year-old streetlights this summer with LED lighting, um, this project, if approved as proposed, would be one more step toward the city's energy reduction goals in addition to being a show of support for Wooddale Church and its value to our neighborhood. Thank you very much. Are there any others who wish to speak either for or against the application? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Commissioners, let's discuss. Are there any concerns or comments on the proposed application? And I, I would like to take a minute and say thank you for everything that you're doing for the Music Box. I, ushed there many, many, many times back when it was Triple Espresso's uh, home. So I, and I used to live in Lauren, Lauren Park, so um, it's really part of my history in Minneapolis. And so thank you for all you're doing. Um, thoughts on the proposal before us? Vice Chair Sandal. Well, shall I kick us off? Um, thank you. Um, applicants for all of the information that you uh, presented today and thank you uh, Dr. Smoley for all the information that you put together. Um, I, as I look at this one, um, I personally, um, I don't have any problems with the dynamic signs. I, I think that the historic character of this property fully embraced dynamic, whatever that meant in the era that you were in, um, and the technology that they had available. I can imagine that there were as many light bulbs as they could possibly afford putting on this marquee, and they probably made them flash as fast as they could make technology go at that time. So I think, you know, our definition of dynamic today and dynamic in those times um, is very different, but at the same time, I think the spirit of that word was applied given whatever technology they had available. Um, so I personally uh, don't have a problem with the dynamic signs, but I do have a couple of other points. Um, I, do, I do agree with staff about the concern about the sign being significantly brighter than they were, but I think the applicant has said that there is an ability to make sure that the maximum illumination level matches the existing 
um, changeable copy sign illumination that's there now, so I would uh, be in support of a condition that would state that. Um, and honestly, one of the things that I have a concern about is on the current design, there's an M emblem on the front facade that projects above the marquee. And for some reason, that has always struck me as something that is um, very unique to the current design and isn't in replication of anything that was historic. And so personally, I would like to see that, that um, M actually eliminated from the design, but I, I have no concerns on, on the other portions of the design as proposed. So um, would like to hear other thoughts um, before I get into um, my recommended motion. Commissioner Nystrom. I tend to agree with Commissioner Sambolt um, about the definition dynamic and thank you for a very thorough presentation. Um, and I also find that with the idea of like climate change in a way, I get that piece of it. Um, but the only issue I have is then what precedent is this setting for other like theaters that will come forward with this? Are we going to then have to continually approve this dynamic version of signage? And I don't know if that's a question for just us internally or staff, but I, I agree though that it would be nice to have. Yeah, I think you I think you make a good point, Commissioner Nystrom, and, and something that I've been struggling with. Um, you know, we have in our new design guidelines that we're about to talk about next, no dynamic signs. Um, and I think that uh, whatever we do with this will factor into that conversation. Um, I think the difference here is that we, we have a theater. Um, it's not a, it's a theater marquee. So that's a difference from the other signage that we often see coming in. So there might be some things we could talk about related to that. Um, so yeah, I, I understand. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Howard. I, um, I, I mean, I guess I'm generally in agreement. I think that there's probably, not probably, that the applicant has demonstrated that there is a way for the sign to appear um, in its kind of historic context, and that's that's great. I mean, I think the concern I would have, and I assume probably where the staff is coming from at this, is that we can't control future use of this sign. We can't control that Wooddale Church is always in control of this building. We're making a decision today for the history, for the future of this building and its historic relevance in the future. And um, it's not like we can stipulate that for the existence of this sign, it, it only be this particular brightness and it never have active characters on it. Um, even if that was something that's in our purview, which I'm almost 100% certain is not, um, it would be an incredibly difficult thing for the city of Minneapolis to monitor and, and work for. So, I, I mean, I, all that is to say, I don't know, I don't know what the answer is, but um, it's more complicated than it sounds, I guess, is my really great <laughs> comments that I'm providing to the body. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Any other thoughts? Vice Chair Sample. Um, I first have a couple of comments um, in, in response to Commissioner Van Der Eyck's uh, comments. I, I do believe that you know we can put some parameters out there for the the dynamic sign. I mean, similar to how we would put um, regulations on any property or any um, you know any conditions that we prescribe. I agree enforcing some rules is harder than others, but uh, that being said, I, I do think that we have some ability. And with that, I'm just gonna dive right into um, making a recommended motion. <laughs> so you can hear my uh, recommended conditions and, and voice agreement, disagreement, or comments. Um, so my recommended motion would be to approve the certificate of appropriateness um, as listed in our agenda and striking condition number one um, but adding a condition that would say that the M logo projecting above the front face of the marquee shall be eliminated from the design. And a second condition that the dynamic signs maximum illumination levels shall be set to match the illumination level of the existing changeable copy signs. 
I welcome any feedback. Thank you, Vice Chair Sambold. Is there a second? We can discuss further if there's a second. I guess my question is, can like, is that a motion we can make with like stating the illumination levels of the sign? Like, I don't even know if that's something that <laughs> can we do that. <laughs> that's my question. I would assume that we can, but I will leave it to staff to answer that. Thank you, Chair Howard, Andrea Burke, Supervisor for the Historic Preservation Team. Yes, you can make that condition, but as you noted earlier, um, our current inspectors do have a very difficult time regulating lumens on dynamic signs and, well, LED in specific, um, because it can be changed so easily with the flip of a switch, but that is a condition you can make if you so choose. Thank you. So we have a motion on the table. Is there a second? If there isn't a second, we would uh, need to withdraw that motion? Or does it just fail? What's the official? <laughs> okay. Yes, Chair Howard, you just make a new motion. <laughs> okay, so we can either second that motion or if someone would like to make a new motion. Do we need to discuss some more? Is, the, is the, what's troubling us the, let's start with the, the M, um, since there were two parts. Commissioner Booty, thank you. Thank you, Chair Howard. Um, sorry, I was just That's okay. scrolling through the application here to find the picture I was looking for. Um, so I, I will say I don't have as much of an issue with the M per se, um, so that was my hesitation seconding the, mes okay. uh, the, the motion, um, and I would, didn't have a lot to add to what it was said earlier with, uh, um, dynamic signs in general um, tend to agree with what it was said. So um, I'll make us another motion <laughs> uh, to uh, see if uh, others would be interested in uh, approving the certificate of appropriateness to replace the historic marquee uh, with a new marquee that displays uh, two dynamic signs on the other signage at 1407 Nicollet Avenue, um, the former Lor Loring Theater, um, subject to the following conditions, striking the uh, condition number one as written in the today's agenda and adding the condition that uh, Commissioner Sandbold wrote the, that uh, the dynamic signs maximum illumination level shall be set to match the illumination level of the existing changeable copy signs. Thank you, Commissioner Thoughtful. Booty. <laughs> Is there a second? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Vice Chair Sandbolt. Any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk, oh, Andrea. Yeah, forgive me, I just, wanna Andrea, I just wanna clarify the motion, Chair Howard, to make sure that um, Commissioner Booty's restated motion was basically not enacting the, leap, not going forward with the M logo, but still keeping the illumination. Is that accurate? That is my understanding. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. If the uh, clerk could please call a roll. Commissioner Booty. Aye. Chair Howard. Aye. Dreyer. Nay. Mastin. Epstein. Nystrom. Aye. Vice Chair Sample. Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Aye. Okay. There are five ayes, one nay, and one abstention. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you all. We'll move on to our last item. Item number six, update to the 2003 Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission's design guidelines for on-premise signings and awnings. This is all wards. The application is for design guidelines adoption. Staff report. 
by John Smoley. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Once again, my name is John Smoley, and I'm pleased to be here to brief you on the update to the 2003 Minneapolis HPC's Design Guidelines for On-Premise Signs and Awnings. The Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission's Design Guidelines for On-Premise Signs and Awnings regulate signs and awnings within the boundaries of locally designated properties throughout the city. They work in conjunction with our zoning code, where the most restrictive provision applies. The guidelines aim to be transparent and easy to administer. Proposals that meet these guidelines are processed as certificates of no change, and requests for exceptions require a certificate of appropriateness. Almost all historic districts defer to these design guidelines in terms of sign and awning standards. Since their adoption in 2003, the HPC's guidelines for on-premise signs and awnings have remained unchanged, though our zoning code standards have relaxed. They've relaxed regulation of sign types, heights, sizes, materials, methods of illumination, and messages. HPC decisions regarding signs and awnings have typically followed suit through the Certificate of Appropriateness and Historic Variance processes. This update that you have before you proposes to codify such trends, further streamlining the development review process, while still reserving the right of property owners to request the HPC grant reasonable exceptions to these standards. Relaxing the HPC sign standards appears appropriate in CPED staff's opinion. Signage for both advertising and identification was very prolific during all of our landmarks and historic districts' periods of significance. Here you can see an example of uh, Murray's as it stands today and uh, how it looked back uh, mid-century. The updated design guidelines streamline development review by eliminating guidelines related to rarely enforced standards, such as regulations regarding sign message, parking lot signage, real estate sign location, master sign plan requirements, and wall signs two foot height maximum. They also eliminate guidelines related to exceptions frequently approved by the HPC and Certificate of Appropriateness applications, such as sign height, number of signs, both by type and on their own, sign area, numbers of illuminated signs, and prohibitions against canopy signs. These proposed guidelines also eliminate redundant standards already regulated by the zoning code, such as allowed sign types, banner sign standards, and project information sign size and location standards. The updated guidelines incorporate additional sections on canopy signs, dynamic signs and murals, as well as a pictorial glossary to help visually identify the different sign types across the city. Staff is also recommending the title of the guidelines be changed to the term premises, plural, to reflect updated zoning code text so they will read uh, the design guidelines for on-premises signs and awnings if you adopt them as proposed. The guidelines incorporate HPC conceptual guidance provided at your retreat this past June, as well as, I'm, I'm sorry, June 30th, 2022, as well as HPC feedback on the draft reviewed and discussed at the HPC meeting on January 31st of this year to include ensuring the terms shall and should are used interchangeably, I'm sorry, intentionally and appropriately, substituting the term character defining features for architectural features, minimizing conflicts between these guidelines and the zoning code, and revising acceptable projecting sign materials to be less specific to match the way freestanding signs are treated. In terms of review and comment, SHPO is recommending adoption of these guidelines, and your CPED staff is too. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you for that. Thank you for that report. Dr. Smiley, commissioners, are there questions for staff? Vice Chair Sample. Uh, thank you, Chair Howard. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Schmoley. Um First, there is uh, one of the regulations is that plastic face covers are not allowed except on channel letter faces. I'm just curious on this one. Like, what are we trying to prevent or what, what's the concern about plastic faces specifically? Madam Chair, Commissioner Sandibolt, I was not here in 2003 for the um, writing of these current guidelines here. My understanding, however, is that plastic face covers are less durable, they're more easily broken, and they're, the way the plastic can be molded is a bit, um, the appearance differs, it, it, it appears a bit lower quality than, say, um, channel cut, um, or channel letters, or say, um, um, Letters, you know, cut through an aluminum, a flat aluminum face with sort of some push-through acrylic. 
Um, I think it's both a durability and an aesthetic intent. Okay. Um, I did have another kind of comment was that um, one of the regulations is that banners and awning signs shall never be illuminated. And one thing I started thinking about when I read that was that um, as we get into an era where the 70s and 80s are getting closer to historic, that to say that those should never be permitted might be a little dangerous. And so kind of my recommended language might be that, you know, to state that not be illuminated unless photographic evidence exists that illumination is a historic condition, um, just to give us more flexibility and longevity of these guidelines. Um, similarly, <laughs> and based on our conversation that we just had a minute ago, was the dynamic signs. Um, you know, with the regulation in here says dy dynamic signs and dynamic changeable copy signs are not permitted. Um, but then the second uh, regulation in that category says historic dynamic signs may be repaired or replaced in kind. Um, and I'm wondering if it makes sense for us to somehow edit that first comment to, to basically say that they shouldn't be permitted unless they existed historically, at which point they would be considered um, by the HPC for replacement. Um, and then only one more comment from me. <laughs> um, the illuminated, in the definitions, the illuminated, illuminated sign backlit has a, a photo next to it. And I just thought uh, as I was going through here that to help understand what is meant by that sign, it might be helpful to have a night photo of an illuminated sign rather than a day photo of a sign that you can't really tell what the illumination kind of character is of that. So those were my three comments as I looked through this. Thank you, Vice Chair Sandbolt. Um, I'll ask a question now before we continue. Um, the, so the purpose of this, these guidelines are so that staff can make these reviews and they don't necessarily have to come before us. So when something says it shall never be permitted or it is not permitted, it's still something that could come before us to say, yes, we see why this should be permitted. Correct? Yes, Madam Chair, that is correct. As you saw with the application tonight for dynamic signage, the current yeah. guidelines prohibit dynamic signs. The, guide, the proposed guidelines as written also prohibit dynamic signs. Exceptions to those guidelines come before you as a certificate of appropriateness request. I just want to make sure that we're, we're all aware of that. So if we do approve it as written, that just means that we're, um, we're going to see more. And then my second question was, can we still make edits to this without having to come before the commission again? Mm. That's a good question. Uh, Madam Chair, absolutely. If you do okay. want to condition approval of the guidelines and you have specific text that you want to see amended, we would need to see that exact text written out the way you'd like it, but we can certainly do that. Okay. If I may jump in, um, yeah, you can, but then they would not be adopted essentially right. yet. Mm -hmm. and, and we would need to go back and modify, and I'm not sure I'm going to ask a question of staff. Would we need to send those back to SHPO? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Well, with that, I think uh, based on the dialogue earlier about the um, dynamic sign, whatever that means, but um, the, um, the perhaps there's a different treatment of theater marquees um, versus like, you know, because if the idea with like that digital boards, we don't want digital boards on um, like everyday signs and awnings, but like that uh, uh, theater marquee, which is not a, uh, not a, a, a common occurrence, maybe has a little bit more flexibility in, in uh, digital marquees was my comment. Um, just, just a reminder, yeah. we're still in questions for staff. So if you have yeah. questions for staff. Yeah, so that was that would be my question. Would be like, is that is that something that would be um, that we could um, tweak to that specific the same item that Commissioner Sambold brought up uh, relative to the um, digital board or whatever it's called. <laughs> uh, Chair Howard, Commissioner Van Der Eyck, we can certainly you know make amendments to the document. Um, yeah. As as um, Andrea Burke noted, I guess we'd have to uh, make those and then bring them back before you and make sure you um, saw everything. Uh, written out the way you'd like to see it, and then we would adopt those at a future, you would adopt those at a future meeting. Got it. 
Any other questions for staff? Yes. Staff would like to add to the response. Um, Chair Howard and Commissioner Vanderite, the other thing to keep in mind, this is just a, a, a stated fact, a lot of our theaters currently do operate under other guidelines that are specifically written for the theaters when they were designated a group. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like 1990. And that's where the theater that just became before you, the lowering theater, that's what it was evaluated under. These guidelines are more specific to wide ranging. And so we specifically chose not to identify theater mark. I mean, well, we, how do, what is the language specifically? I think I feel like we had this discussion, John, where we specifically decided not to include the theater marquees, or we had it in there, but then we took it out to make it more general so that the guidelines for the theaters would be that. Now, that's not to say that a future theater that gets designated, should that so happen, would maybe not be subject to this. It's possible in that case, that particular landmark, should it be designated, may have its own guidelines that came up with. But um, I just wanted to make that distinction. And am I am I correct, John, in that that was how that, this lang we went over this language a lot. <laughs> um, Understandably. And so that's, that's how we came up with the, the current language. Did you have another question? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, just a clarifying question on that. I apologize. I didn't know um, the distinction there. But so for uh, if I'm if I'm understanding that correctly, all designated theaters, theaters that are historic to designated have their own like a, 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 an umbrella signage guidance. That is what you're referring to. That would be more specific to that particular use. Well, Chair Howard and Commissioner Van Dyke, the theaters that were designated yeah. specifically under these under this particular resolution got, it. got some specific guidelines that went with them at the time. Got it. Um, so it's the Loring Theater. It's the I'm got blanking it. on the other ones. Avalon, Hollywood, Avalon, Hollywood. There was five or six. Actually, I think five of them. Granada. Yeah, ah, that all came through, and so all of those guidelines apply, and it sort of says that at the beginning of those guidelines that, that those particular theaters apply. It's not all theaters. Um, right. But yeah. Yeah, I think that, so in response to that, um, Chair um, Dr. Smalley, that um, I was fine with these signage guidelines before I was happy to come here and approve them. I just, this, this conversation has brought up another um, topic that it, may, it concerns me. I don't... Um, I want to make things easier for all of us. I want to make things easier for you guys to approve um, and for our applicants to navigate this process. And so I wonder if there, if that would make sense. That was why I brought the question forward. So, Any other questions for staff? Okay, thank you. I will now open the public hearing for this item. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak for or against these guidelines? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Okay, now we can formally discuss. Commissioner Van der Eyck. So, like I said, I, um, I, I, I believe that Dr. Smoley has done a, a lot of really wonderful work. I'm pretty sure his doctorate is in signage at this point. Um, <laughs> Um, on, I know on, you got a second degree. Uh, yeah, <laughs> on, uh, on this stuff. So I feel um, in support. And the last thing I want to do is, is send the staff home with more homework. Um, but I do want to feel comfortable that we've got, because um, our guidelines are what we utilize, and they don't get updated very often, as we can clearly see. Um, so I want to make sure that we think deeply about the implications of them and, um, and this this dialogue on, on the Loring Theater gave us that opportunity to do so. So I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm interested to hear the rest of the commission's feedback on it, but I think that it's worth noting and worth having the discussion. Thank you, Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Other thoughts? Commissioner Booty. Thank you, Chair Howard. And I just wanted to kind of echo your point earlier um, when during the question period uh, about if there are exceptions to the, the language that are written in the guidelines as we saw today, um, the up for a discussion with us um, versus, um, which I, I feel comfortable having that mm -hmm. be in play um, considering 
there might be some special circumstances that are working with, um, with certain properties. Um, so I think there could be some, potentially some flexibility there depending on the property and the applicant. Thank you, Commissioner Booty. Other thoughts? <laughs> Commissioner Vander? Could I ask Commissioner Sandoval to restate the comments that you had um, to the, that it, cause it sounded like maybe you had some amendments you would like to see made beyond uh, this digital signboard thingy. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, the one, the one uh, suggestion that remains of my kind of comments and questions that I uh, brought up earlier was that on item 1.9, it is currently stated as banners and awnings signs shall never be illuminated. Um, and kind of my suggested would possibly be not be illuminated unless photographic evidence exists that such, a, such illumination was a historic condition. In all reality, I feel like that's rare enough that I'm in support of approving um, the, the design guidelines as proposed. Um, all right, yeah, so I agree. I think that um, that makes a lot of sense. I, I agree with your point, and I agree that we can find a way to work with our applicants on that. Um, and, and furthermore, to the point that, of the dialogue we had today, like obviously we've got some sense of overlapping di design guidelines and, and uh, zoning ordinances and all this stuff. And to some extent, it's a reality of the fact that some of this stuff is going to come in conflict with one another. So we will have to have these kind of conversations. And I trust that our staff um, is, is talented and skilled enough to know when the appropriate time to bring that forward for us is. So with that, I would like to make a motion, which I never do, <laughs> um, uh, to, um, to approve the um, uh, to adopt the design guidelines for on-premise sign and awnings. Thank you, Commissioner Van Der Rijk. Before I ask for a second, uh, Ms. Burke, would you did you have something that you wanted to say? Yeah, Chair Howard, I I, I was just going to kind of reiterate the sentiment that essentially, as you stated, Chair Howard, these have greatly given more administrative approval authority to staff and have taken away more. C of A's from you. That said, where where we have stated that language it essentially just ensures that that's where we will be bringing things to you, and that it, obviously you can make your own decision. But that was a very conscious decision on behalf of staff that we didn't feel certain types of proposals were a desktop decision; they were an HPC decision that deserved testimony and and transparency. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Burke. We have a motion on the table. Is there a second? Nice room seconds. Thank you, Commissioner Nystrom. Any further discussion? I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for taking some of the signs off of our plate. <laughs> um, <laughs> seeing no other further discussion, will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Booty. Aye. Chair Howard. Aye. Commissioner Dreyer. Aye. Commissioner Mastin. Aye. Commissioner Nystrom? Aye. Vice Chair Sambolt? Aye. Commissioner Van Der Eyck? Aye. There are seven ayes. Thank you, that motion passes, and that concludes our public hearing items. Do commissioners or staff have any announcements or commission business to discuss? And I'll start with staff. Ms. Burke. Thank you, Chair Howard. Um, I do, I would mention that earlier this afternoon, the commutator project did uh, go to biz on appeal for two conditions. Um, conditions one and two, I don't expect you to remember those, but they largely had to do with the entrance and that appeal to strike those conditions was approved by the biz committee. So it will next go to council for final approval. Um, the Washburn Fair Oaks <laughs> design guidelines update. I'm gonna cough one moment. <coughs> I hope I didn't do that into the microphone. But um, we are wrapping up our um, comments on this um, draft. We received a draft from the consultants. And just to give you an update on what's going to happen next, we've relayed our comments to the consultant. They are um, putting forth our comments. And then what will happen next is once we get the final draft, uh, middle to the end of June, we will open the document up for public comment for 30 days. All of this will be happening 
prior to even bringing this before you as a discussion item. Um, so it's very, very in advance of the process, but I wanted to let you know. Um, and so then we will receive public comments on it um, and then decide how we you know, take those comments, make any changes thus forth before it comes to you. But since this has been a big project our team has then taken up over the last six months, um, I wanted to give an update. Um, and then also the Community Connections Conference is this Saturday from not 9 o'clock to, is it 3 o'clock? 3 o'clock um, over at the Convention Center. So I encourage you to stop by. Aaron um, from our team and Rob from our team will be manning our booth, staffing our booth. And they will be um, talking about our program as well as some of the work on the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund grant. Those are all my updates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? All right. With that, we have completed all items on the agenda for this meeting. I will ask members and staff once more if there are any other matters to come before the commission. There being no other business to come before this meeting, and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission is June 20th, 2023. Thank you all. Care and Control is here to help, and you can help too. If you see aggressive animals or animals on the loose, call 311. To find out more about Animal Care and Control and how you can be a responsible pet owner, check out the City of Minneapolis website.